Hi, I'm Sunny Dean. And I'm Scott Drakeford. And this is the Publishing Radio Podcast. In 2022, we both launched debut novels in the same genre with the same publisher in the same year. But despite having very similar starts, our books, and subsequently each of our careers, went in very different directions. That pattern repeats itself throughout the industry over and over. Why do some books succeed while others seem to be dead on arrival? In this podcast, we aim to answer those questions and many more, along with how to build and maintain an author career. Everyone signing a contract deserves to know what they're really signing up for. In an industry that loves its secrets, we'll be sharing real details from real people. We'll cover the gamut of life as a big five published author, from agents to publishing contracts, finances, and more. Welcome to this week's Publishing Radio, and I'm going to break from our usual intro format just a little bit to say that, you know, last week, or whenever it was, we broke the 100,000 downloads mark, which was really cool, and <laughs> I just wanted to say thank you to Yay. all the people who've listened, and to all the people who've shared, <laughs> and also our supporters who we've, like, never mentioned, because because we never actually actively sought support for the, the podcast, but it does kind of like almost pay for itself now, which is very cool. Uh, it means we don't have to resort to, resort to starting an OnlyFans cool. for Scott. <laughs> uh, with us today, we have Gail Carriger, who has had a really interesting career through YA and other age categories and different genres. And I think actually might be best if we let you introduce yourself, Gail, and um, have I said your name right? Sorry. I'm suddenly panicked. It's like Jill. That's okay. It's it's funny. I, I chose a pen name that I thought would be easy to pronounce, and then nobody pronounces it right. My real name is impossible to pronounce, so that's one of the reasons I have a pen name. But it's Kara Gurr with the hard G, but, you know, oh, it's a pen name, okay. so you can pronounce it however you want. I got this kid in the game. <laughs> yeah, so hi, I'm Gail Kara Gurr. I was trad for a really long time, and now I'm a pretty solid hybrid author, and I just celebrated my debut book's 14th birthday a couple of days ago, but I had a lot of contract negotiations first, so technically this is my 15th year of being a published author. So yeah, people come to me for advice starting out and what it's like to be an author right now, and I was like, I can't help you because it's been over a decade, but you should listen to this (laughs) podcast. Because that's why I started listening, is I was like, I can't give advice on a thing that hasn't happened to me in a really long time. And then you started to give me PTSD, because I was like, nothing has changed. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it changes and it doesn't. Uh, so how did you get... We hear that a lot. Uh, how did you get into publishing? And what was kind of your experience with that first forays? So I'm one of those writers who always wrote, and I always wrote fiction, but I actually grew up in a kind of hippie commune sort of situation with a lot of poets. And so I thought, well, we don't make money writing. That's not a valid career path. We're never going to do that. Uh, We'll just do this as a hobby. It'll just be fun, fun times. (laughs) My background is actually as an archaeologist. Mm -hmm. So I have an MA and an MS. I'm a materials analyst by training, which means I'm a social scientist I have a lot of background in um, stats and research and um, material science and that sort of thing, which I'm mentioning because my obsession with data and data analytics has really helped my career as an author. (laughs) Um, My uh, delight in spreadsheets, for example, turned out to be a a magic superpower for a writer. So that's where I, that's my background. I was um, most of the way through my PhD and pretty much a full-time academic adjunct faculty and teaching and stuff when my first book got picked up. And that's just cause I wrote because I liked writing. And if I wrote and finished a thing, I might as well try to publish it was kind of my attitude. I had a couple shorts published and things like that. Talking about spreadsheets, you mentioned that spreadsheets have been a bit of a superpower for you as an author. What do you mean by that? You know, what have what have you used your stats and spreadsheet acumen for in this my, world? My magic power. <laughs> mm-hmm. This is something. So one of the things I'm very sort of thoughtful about uh, and careful about over the years has been my brand. Uh, mm-hmm. So I don't really publicly talk about teaching or the background of publishing. Like I don't, 
I don't have my own podcast like this one. I, I only appear on other people's podcasts. So I actually had the reputation for years in that I that didn't teach. I didn't talk about craft of writing, all this sort of stuff, which I've slowly been changing over the last couple of years. But it's mostly because when I am on social media and online, I would like to interact with my readers. That's what my time is being spent for. Not my fellow authors, much as I love you. Um, my job online is to promote my books and my brand and talk to my readers. So um, I've been very careful about not associating the two. So that's sort of the starter. So I, but I do love data and I have been collecting it from the get go. And I actually started um, a hybrid model just with some short stories way back in 2016. So I started to upload my own content rather than going through publishers, specifically because they obfuscated data and I wanted to know things mostly because I'm obsessed with efficiency and I was like if I am spending time online or if I am being sent on a 10 city 10 day book tour I would like to know concretely whether that is effective or not so <laughs> please publisher tell me like how many additional books did you sell off baseline because you you like destroyed my health for two weeks, right? Could we talk about that? Uh, no, it turns out with a publisher, you cannot talk about that. So I was like, I need access to data. Um, like your publisher tells me I must be on Twitter. Yes, but when I post about a book on Twitter, does that lead to clicks or clicks and conversions? Do I actually sell books or is it just a bunch of looky-loos on Twitter? So um, the only way to find that information out is to is to upload the book and then track what's going on with it myself. And so that's that's how I started. And so I have been collecting this sort of wealth of data on effective places online, on, you know, just tracking things via my web website mostly since 2016. And I was front list already by that time. So I have, you know, a good solid fan base and, and I run experiments on them <laughs> constantly. <laughs> and they're usually like, but like some the author guild or something will publish like data on book discoverability and where readers are going to get new books online. And I'll be like, that doesn't seem right. Like you asked a bunch of authors that question. That's not useful we should ask readers this question this should be yeah. data that bookbub or goodreads or somebody is trying to figure out of course they're not and i was like well i'll just ask my readers i have a reader group on facebook with 40,000 members like i'll ask them yeah. and see what survey data i get um and i will get just as many you know i'll get up to a thousand or two thousand people which is you know pretty good participant levels um so i do that kind of thing all the time i just and if people want to talk about themselves, the survey is just people talking about themselves. Readers. Readers love to tell you what they want to read next, what they're reading, da 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 da, da. So, yeah. So I, the so, answer is I have a big audience and I fleece them all the time. <laughs> and then oh I'll, I'll, at the back end, I'm also tracking everything because people will tell you one thing and actually do something else. So. Imagine if publishers did yeah, that. Yeah, so, so what uh, <laughs> secrets can you share with us? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of secrets can I share? Well, I can tell you that way back in 2018, when I first started seriously tunneling to Twitter, I could have told you at that point in time that Twitter is not a place you sell books. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. a place writers hang out and talk about books. And it does yeah. get, and you know, a writer, a writer who is tracking will tell you, you get great clicks off of Twitter. And that is true. I get great clicks off of Twitter, but no sales or very few sales compared to some of the other venues and marketplaces. So, yeah. So I had already what's called outposted Twitter. In other words, I didn't re I don't really engage very much there. I don't hang out there very much in like late early 2019. I was like, Twitter's not useful to me. I mean, you know, it can be fun to talk about stuff on Twitter, but it's not useful. So I had fled already. Um, so so when everybody else. I was like, yeah, it's, Twitter's not good. It's not a good, doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't make a big difference. Um, it's not what people are there for. Uh, so yeah, stuff like that. Uh, you know, I can, I also will like combo data and triage data on like, so somebody will make a recommendation on like an ads platform or something. And I'll go in and like, I'll run some numbers and do some you know, quick ad testing of different tactics, like ad tactics, like a guru like Dawson or somebody will make a claim and I'll be like, I don't think that works for a trad author or like me, a, a wide hybrid author. It's like, I, you know, I have to charge a different price point than a lot of other indie authors, partly because it's expectation of my brand. And so like some, a lot of their tactics don't work. So I'll run tests a lot on that, that kind of thing. Uh, for example, this doesn't apply to you guys who are purely trad, but there's a lot of chatter about whether you put a newsletter onboarding link at the beginning of your book 
or at the end of your book and which is more effective and I was like well my ass will test that <laughs> um, guess what equally effective do both everybody <laughs> that kind of thing yeah, so, so so it basically allows me to like go tunnel in change some metadata and test things that other people claim and admittedly I'm mostly testing them on me and my audience but yeah. mostly the data I care about but it is somewhat often somewhat applicable if you have a different if you have a similar career path to mine in terms of you know how you're how you're trying to reach an audience so that all that all makes sense are there and you mentioned things that don't work and uh, uh, you know twitter and one thing that does are there are there channels though that you have found that initial exposure uh, uh or that ability to find initial exposure and that have worked better for you um and i i realized that it's segmented by genre by by a yes. whole bunch of different factors but it'd still yes. be interesting to hear discoverability is that what you're talking about discoverability yeah like places where new, where new readers find you as opposed to existing readers yeah whether whether it's you know uh being more active on certain platforms or mm. running ads or uh things that your your publisher has done and we'll, we'll get into that we have mm. we have a lot of questions about your uh, entire yeah. journey uh but i'm just curious since we're on this topic if there are avenues mm. that have been fruitful so the the biggest thing i tested recently with my discoverability data poll which is and if anybody um incidentally out there would like to have access to this unfortunately it is ip guarded only for the us so you need to be us based for it that's not me that's wordpress's decision but just drop me a calling card on my website it basically sends me an email and it's a it's a protected post but it is a post that's accessible to people so if anybody's interested in the discoverability data stuff just let me know um, and I'll give you the code word so you can read the post. It's just not public because I don't want it to be scraped. And I don't, like I said, I don't yeah. want a ton of traffic to my website that's this back end stuff. Um, but I am willing to share my data. And yeah, sure. that particular that particular one, um, oh, sorry. Uh, I, I initially started it because there's this just accepted thing, which is how do you find a new book? And I specifically, this was the question I specifically asked is like, I went to open places where you can't do multi-poll options first and just had conversations with readers about this, including Twitter. And um, because I wanted to use the language that readers use when they talk about discovering things. So mm -hmm. I didn't, because author we, a big mistake that a lot of authors make is in assuming that their readers are going to behave exactly like them. And that's just not true. That's one of the great lessons I've learned over the years is uh, my readers don't read like I do. They don't act like I do. And they don't have the same language that I do because they're not writers. They're not in the industry. So they don't use words like audience or discovery data or discoverability. Like they just don't. So I have to figure out how to ask them questions that they entirely understand. So I did a really open one first, which is um, if you're looking for a new author or a new book, brand new to you, what do you do? Where do you go? Who do you ask? Um, and then I just collected things that they said and then tried to formulate them into poll proper survey questions. So the survey questions were a little long. I also had a different objective than a lot of people. Um, so like one of the things I did was divide libraries and bookstores up from each other. They probably should be confined because essentially that's kind of a foot traffic um, reader loyalty, print loyalty situation. So it's often a very similar demographic. So the people who will say, well, I walk into my local bookstore and find a new book that way are pretty much the same people who say, I'll go to the library and see what's on the recommendation shelf. It's kind of a shared thing, but I divided them up because as a, when I'm doing indie, I can reach libraries, but it's real hard for me to reach bookstores. So for me, it's important to have that. So understand that I also have a personal objective when you're looking at this kind of data that I'm gathering. Um, but essentially, I wanted to know if the old adage, I find a new book because a friend recommended it, was true. Like, we've all accepted that for years, that that's the number one reason people buy a book is because a friend recommended it or a colleague or whatever. And I was like, is that true? Or is that just one of these publishing industry things, <laughs> though, like green book cover covers don't sell as well as other books, you know, <laughs> like publishing is full of these weird things. So I was like, I'm going to test it. Um, yeah, it's true. Uh, the highest percentage by a landslide was a friend rec recommended it. Now the definition of friend can include parasocial influencer friendships because I didn't ask 
people to distinguish what they mean by friend, whether it was an in-person friend or an online friend or like, and how nuanced, right? And that's generational as well. Different mm. generations think about what friend means differently if you yeah. come of age online or not. So I didn't, I didn't ask them to distinguish that, uh, but they themselves chose to distinguish whether it was an author recommendation or not. So um, to make this very useful for people listening, recommendation by a friend was number one by a landslide. Then shockingly coming in just sort of after that was recommendations by an author. So not a cover blurb, but an author actually, and not a retweet of your launch post but an author actually on their social media or in their newsletter saying, oh my God, I read this new book and I loved it. Yeah. So that's a really good tip. So if you have an author who you love and who agreed to blurb your book and actually really liked it, encouraging them to not just blurb it, but to actually talk about it in some concrete way um, is a really, does seem to be very powerful. So that was one big takeaway for me. And then um, a surprising number said, it, within bookstores and within the library. For me, I think that's because I come out of trad. So I'm asking my own audience these questions, but a lot of them do that. A so shockingly high number said, for, from my perspective, said the publishers of uh, social media feeds. So if your publisher is like, specifically Tor is very popular, it turns out. Um, so, you know, those are the ones I can remember off the top of my head. I encourage anybody who's really interested in this just to drop me a quick email and I'll send you the, um, I'll send you the, the blog post and the. Yeah, we'll, we'll, have, we'll post up a link towards it and the, in the kind of the show notes and stuff at the end. Um, but yeah, I was wondering actually if we could, before we get too much into the data, if we could go back into kind of how you did get picked up and what that story was like for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we jumped. Yes. <laughs> Scott got excited. We jumped ahead. Um, so the story is Solus, and this is back in 2007, uh, was one of when Tor still had open subs, among other things. Um, it, and it was a slush pile pick, my, my, first, my first published book. So a publishing house that shall remain nameless of good reputation, if not particularly substantial size, uh, picked up Solus and fell in love with it and really wanted to publish it. And I said, that's great. Let me get an agent. <laughs> so I went through the process of finding an agent, which was interesting, uh, but it landed me with Kristen Nelson, who is still my agent 15 years later, who I love. <laughs> um, you're going to have one relationship for the whole time. Having a good agent <laughs> is, is optimal as far as I'm concerned. Um, so uh, she went into negotiations with the first house that had interested. So essentially I went with an offer on the table. Uh, it was not a very good offer. It was like three grand or something like that. But I didn't really care that much because again, happily uh, archeologist and academic, like having a grand old time in my other career. Um, and so I was like, okay, go negotiate. And that negotiation turned out to be an absolute nightmare. Um, now I remember you guys talked with a couple about this, but, um, in my case, it was the option clause, which is sometimes called the exclusivity clause or whatever it is. But essentially, I'm a full-time academic. This option clause is for anything I wrote under any name. That's way too broad. And I literally was like, I cannot sign that contract. I mm. will not sign that contract. Um, and the editor was like, but but we don't, I was like, I'm an academic. I will be publishing white papers. I have one on submission right now. Like I can't, you want my nonfiction. You cannot have my nonfiction. And the editor was like, well, we don't want it. You don't actually, I was like, it says in the contract, I have to give it to you. If you don't want it, exclude it in the contract. And they were like, nope, it's the boilerplate or nothing. And I was like, well, then I won't sign. Uh, and this took six months seven eight months like it took for this was just insane and my poor agent brand new agent is getting like screamed at by this editor literally um and, and Kristen's pretty like baseline nice lady midwesterner and she was like this is ridiculous and I'd be like oh if she's screaming at you she's probably gonna scream at me so let's I, I'm not married to Liz and, and eventually <laughs> my agent was like, let's just see if anyone else is interested. Let's just see. Now you're not supposed to do this when you're in the middle of negotiations. But I was like, 
yeah, let's just see. And it turned out others were interested in this book. And it's a weird, funny little multi-genre book that probably would not get picked up now. Um, but at the time, it, it kind of sat in a niche that was open, which is mm. comedic sci-fi fantasy written by a female voice, like with a kind of feminist bent. Um, and, uh, and historical and a bunch of other weird things. It's steampunk, essentially. And um, yeah, and the other houses were interested in it. And eventually we ended up just going with Orbit. Now, Orbit offered me a 25K deal, which at the time is a very good deal. Yes. I don't know what publishers would call it, but it was a good deal um, for two books. And and that's one of Orbit's, I think it's still one of their standards, is they tend to option for a two, they like a, yeah. a two book deal. It's kind of one of their things. And it's still 25K um, as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, twenty five k is not peanuts. It's not. It's not like like I always say. It's also not an income, right? <laughs> like that's that's twenty five k minus my agent's cut minus da, da 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 minus the tax code. What I mean, yeah, sorry. What I mean is it's not gone up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, uh, but it was it was decent. But I I'm telling you the the blank numbers mm. because you guys have talked about this before. That tells you how much they're willing to risk on your yeah. what your advance tells you more than anything is how much they're going to spend on your marketing budget yeah. and what they're going to do with you and what they're going to be interested in doing with you. It told me and eventually I didn't realize this at the time, but my agent that they were going to spend something to try and get this try and get it some kind of traction they weren't gonna do the you know tour throw the spaghetti at the wall for three grand policy um, they're gonna do something with it so um, they flew me out to BEA that year the year of my debut and a bunch of stuff happened at BEA tour had pulled out uh, this is the first year they weren't there which meant the big rep for sci-fi fantasy was this void at BEA um, and it had kind of been last minute ish. And so a lot of the attendees didn't really know that. So it was the first thing that happened. I had like begged and pleaded for Solus to be released as a mass market paperback. I don't know yeah. if that did much good, uh, my pleading, but that is what they released it as. And um, that was great because it had a low price point because Briggs and Butcher, and this is Carragher, Briggs and Butcher had big releases in their urban fantasies. And I thought, you know, I'll sit next to them on the shelf and I really want that market share. And someone's going in to buy those suckers at 30 bucks a pop because they're hardcover releases. Maybe they'll spend another eight bucks on my little weird mass market. And that is exactly what ended up <laughs> happening. Um, but it meant that the arc was mass market and tour wasn't there. And a bunch of people in New York just, who were genre readers, just picked up this little mass market thing with a weird steampunk cover, what's the steampunk thing anyway, pocketed it and read it on public transport on the way home. So like, because there was no other genre really being released at BEA that year. And so it had this like weird little bubble of sensation and it just hit a bunch of reviewers and librarians and industry folks within the market. It had a really unusual, very eye-catching cover that would go on to like win awards and stuff like that. Now it looks really dated. At the time it was really unique. Um, and yeah, and, and that kind of jump started it. Like the buzz started at that juncture. Um, and so people kind of knew about it by the time it was actually releasing into the world. And it didn't have a strict on sale in SOS. So it kind of started dropping a little bit early. People started picking it up at Borders because Borders still exist in Barnes and Noble. Um, Jim, who was the buyer for BNN, loved the cover too. So did the Borders people. So they ordered kind of more than they normally would. Also, again, it's cheap. So, you know, most Borders had about 12 copies or something for a debut. Like a lot of weird serendipitous stuff happened with this book. It's an October release. There's no, there was no major competition in the industry at the time except for these heavy hitters within series is. And it just, you know, people picked it up. It, it, it's really funny because, you so know- So you mentioned- Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, you know, it's funny to me because we were talking about how Trad has all these rules for things that, that are and aren't set in stone. And one of them, one of the rules that's always set in stone for sci-fi and fantasy is steampunk doesn't sell. <laughs> So, yeah. um, I just yeah. find it funny to listen to the story of this, the, the, the steampunk book that could. So. Yes, it's the one. Uh, I mean, uh, 
uh, Paula Bacigalupi's Wind Up Girl, and which is sort of steampunk dystopian, and Cherry Priest's Bone Shaker. And then there was a mm. Levi- Leviathan Wakes, Scott Westerfield. Mm. So there were a couple that did pretty good. Yeah, so it did it did surprisingly well. It surprised everybody. Um, the other thing it did was really well in ebook. So it for Orbit it was the top ebook seller, and also unusual percentage wise. And there was like twenty five percent sales in ebook, which Orbit had n- never had before. So. Uh, and we we talked to uh, you've listened to the show so we you know this but we talked to a lot of people about specifically what variables may have influenced you know that initial wave of of attention so you mentioned that orbit had made arcs and had them ready in time to send you to a, a big industry uh yeah. convention that's what bea is right that's what i'm understanding is yes. that it's it, sorry it, yes is it like a lot of booksellers and, and librarians and stuff that are there? People who are decision makers on buying or who who's the primary attendant there? It used to be the biggest basically book industry convention mm. um, probably in the world. I think probably bigger than Frankfurt, I, I would like to say, having wow. been to both of them. Okay. It felt bigger. Um, but it was at the Javits. Um, I don't even, I think it's still going, but it's probably quite a bit died down now. Uh, but you... it's massive, and it was mostly publishers. So mostly publishers and industry. So do you happen to know how many arcs they printed? So, and and I'm asking this for a, a particular reason. I have a theory. Well, it's not like a, a very minimum viability theory, but... of arcs kind of thing. Yeah, I yeah. don't know. Um, I do know my first print run was 10k for Solus. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I also can tell you, <laughs> again, because I read my royalty reports and I'm really clear about my numbers, that back in the day for mass market for New York Times, you had to sell 10K in a week to get that mm. list for mass market mm. adult listing. It's more than that for hardcover. And it was, again, later because I was released later in hardcover. So again, I always try to pay attention to what my print runs are and what my like sell through is in the first week when I hit a list. Uh, Cause I'm like, how many, what are hackable, right? Like it isn't, but I was curious anyway. Um, but the print run does make a difference because you have to have a print run big enough to hit the list to start with. And it was for the first, for my, so my first five book series all came out in mass market um, and pretty much consistently for them. Cause every single one hit after that, it was about 10,000 in that first uh, New York times window period, Tuesday to Tuesday. Um, and that's about what I could sell. Yeah, just a fun comparison. My print run, my initial print run of hardcovers was also 10,000. But I got none of the rest of it. None, right? So yeah. uh, I have this theory, and again, I'm sure it's not a very unique theory, that there's two primary methods from what we've seen here on the show and heard on the show and just generally uh, have been able to hunt down that you have to, like Sun, you said, you kind of have to hit some critical mass. And the best ways that people or publishers are doing that are, one, through massive exposure to consumers, right? And so that's things like uh, huge ARC giveaways. Like we've we've Mm -hmm. heard stories of ARC giveaways in tens of thousands, um, sneak peek giveaways in the hundreds of thousands or even millions for these series or books that end up becoming very popular or more often it's effort put into what I would call um, leveraged distribution and pre-publication hype that uh, affects that leveraged distribution and what I mean by leveraged distribution is exactly what you're describing is building hype with booksellers and industry people where for every one of them that you win over, you're selling probably, you know, in the ballpark of 20 to 100 plus books every year, right? Um, so yeah, that makes a ton of sense. Yeah. I have to say I had the librarians in a big way. I got the ALA, the Alex Award, 
from the librarian market for Solus. They were early big recognizers. They were also the bloggers. They were also at BEA. They were like prime category. They just happened to jump on and love this book in mass market, but for libraries. And this is why from an indie author perspective, it's so hard to hack the lists is because that distribution is particularly tightly controlled that the distribution to the movers and shakers for lack of but I mean, it's in the end, it's all networking, right? It's networking for your author career. Like, I can't tell you how many authors I know who found their agents at events, like, or because a different author told them to try their agent or gave them a personalized, like, I think your personalities would suit. I'll wreck you to my agent. Sure. You know, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it's a lot of this is networking. One of the, you know, people, newbie authors will come up to me together and, uh, to, to talk, you know, early career. And I'll be like, I don't know how helpful my advice is because it's been so long, but I can tell you one thing, which is make author friends make author friends, author friends now, author friends as you progress through your career. One of my favorite stories to tell is actually a Wesley story. Um, you interviewed Wesley Chu a little while ago, but I was at uh, World Fantasy when Barnes and Noble, Barnes and Noble had really pressed me to do a set, to do 500 signed pre-ordered. So people, if people pre-ordered this third book from Barnes and Noble online, they could get a signed edition. And so they and they had missed the tipped in window so they had to send me the physical boxes of books it had been this like nightmare to organize i had to go and sign 500 books in the space of an afternoon at a like weird hotel like it was all a nightmare and uh, and then they promptly lost them and then they just sent out 500 emails saying your order has been canceled wow <laughs> and like in the re release day like not before or they just release day. And so like I lost 500 sales. And so I'm at World Fantasy when this happens because I'm on, I'm like midway through a book tour and uh, and I just, and I'm hanging out and I'm drinking at the bar at World Fantasy. And I am telling this to Peter Brett and Wesley Chu. And I just started bawling. Cause it's like, I don't know what can I do, you know? And uh and they just like did this like protective huddle around me <laughs> where they were like the Linda B.C. Gale, like just freaking out. And they were just like so sweet and so kind. And Pete, who has had this kind of thing happen before, who's one of those friends, who's like a peer of mine, basically was like, here's what you do. You calm down, you get on the internet tomorrow when you have a little window of time and you email every single one of them back and you say, when I get off my tour, if you want to send me your address, I will send you a signed sticker that you can put on a copy of the book. And and you you are out the 35 cents for the stamp and it's going to take you quite a bit of time. You're going to have to sign, you know, 200, 300 again. Um, but that's what you do. And that's exactly what I did. And then it made it all better. And I got 250 emails <laughs> of my fans who I would eventually pop on a newsletter, you know, <laughs> little benefits. But... Yeah, it, it and that was author friends. Like, so the moral of the story is yeah. is make author friends. You have no idea when you're going to need them, but you need them. No, I would very much agree. And I think even for me, not being able to do traditional networking, I could still build online communities and found that very helpful. Um, yes. I was just going to ask two quick questions. One for Scott, which is, Scott, why are your nails painted black? <laughs> and the, <laughs> the other one for Gail is, um, did, just very randomly, do you happen to know what a good pre-order number looks like on a book? <laughs> uh, a good pre-order number on a book? Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Scott, you answer first. <laughs> why are your nails black? <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't they be black? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. They... <laughs> They look great. Actually, up close, they don't look that great. Uh, my my eight-year-old uh, painted them for me, as she does every now and then. I have to make sure it's, you know, black or something somewhat acceptable and not princess sparkles or whatever. But, um, yeah, so it's, you know, ha Halloween appropriate. And I look fantastic. I thanks. <laughs> Sparkles are appropriate to everybody. Everybody should wear sparkles. <laughs> Uncover your inner, inner sparkle. It's got hey, okay. I, yeah, I mean, uh, no, no shade to anybody that has princess sparkle uh, fingernails. <laughs> Whatever you want to do is great. A couple I, of years ago, my know, partner just... dyed his beard like glittery green for Christmas. So, you know, love it. 
it's mostly the glitter that I don't like. I, I just really don't like the texture on my nails. Okay. I don't like it when it's falling off on stuff, you know, so. If you do the sheeny oil slick, like, you know, gunmetal or something. Metallic. Uh, I mean, that'd be cool. Um, yeah, that'd be cool, I guess. Yeah, that'd be cool. <laughs> um, all right. Uh, what were we? Pre-orders. Oh, pre-order numbers. I can tell you what. <laughs> yes. I can tell you now, like, with my fan base, what a pre-order number is and kind of what it gets me out the back end in terms of, like, as an indie publisher, because that's what I have the data on. Um, and that the answer to that is it's probably something on the order of about 250 at least. And this is just to hit, you know, number one, at least a couple of categories on Amazon, which I, I question whether that's actually useful or not. Um, and to have a, you know, sort of significant sell through in order to like hit a bunch of algorithms on some of the other platforms and stuff. So it's about 250 pre-orders on Amazon, um, which works out to about, you know, 40 to 50 on all of the other platforms. Um, and then now these days for me, I get about 200 or so pre-orders on direct sales as well. I've, I've, uh, offboarded a lot to direct sales, just, you know, again, direct access no, to that's data fine, and yeah. uh, direct access to my fans. That is helpful um, actually. Cause and the, sorry, I was just going to say, cause a lot of people have asked me in private, like other debut authors, like, Oh, I've got pre-orders. What do they mean? What's a good number? And nobody really knows. And I think a couple of people that I was talking to, you know, they'll get upset at like, I've only got 150 or 200 and I was kind of thinking for a debut well, that's, that's good. really good <laughs> like that's very good yeah yeah that's very good yeah I would say good over 100 especially mm-hmm. for a debut because it just means it just it's just telling you that you're getting the word out to people and there's a real trust model involved when you're debuting in particular mm-hmm. and especially if you're debuting in trad because the price point's so high and so, um, yeah, those pre those pre-order numbers are excellent because it, a lot of readers, and I get this, you know, they're just not going to take a risk on a newer author that's a very don't. expensive book. <laughs> Sorry. Um, they're definitely not going to pre-order. Yeah, yeah. no, I, I don't. Like, I wait until there's at least a sample I can read mm. first or it's in the library and I can, like, check check it like I just Mm -hmm. I mean partly that's because as a writer I'm pretty invested in kind of the flavor and style of the author's voice and there are some author voices that just really turn turn me off and I'm just not gonna bother um so yeah uh I think people just dream big yeah they do you you do that's true um but yeah lower your expectations everybody (laughs) yes (laughs) yeah and very quick um one of the things that you mentioned on your, your list to talk about that I was kind of interested in was selling the film rights under Thai options and what that story was involved and was about. Yeah. Yeah. So this specific- is really you talk, to, you talk to people who had what sounded like wide options and stuff. And then, you, you, Scott, are you going to mention the turning down the deal? <laughs> yeah. That's specifically yeah. what I want to hear about is the, that note you have on there. So go for it. Essentially, when they option your book, they're optioning the rights to the world and the characters, not really the story. This confuses people a lot, which is why when your favorite book gets optioned, you can't expect it to be exactly like what was written most of the time. So again, back in 2012, when Steampunk was on its heyday, this is the story Scott wants, uh, Sony approached to option the Finishing School series. And uh, it was a million dollar offer. And because uh, the Finishing School series had hit New York Times twice already in hardcover, they were doing really well. That is the series that I got a six figure advance for. So, you know, they were throwing a ton of guns behind it. It was the heyday of steampunk. Everybody was excited by this new movement, the beauty of it, everything, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so we were negotiating and I was like, well, for a million dollars, I'll be a little less a little bit more relaxed but the previous series was already under option so they we had to have some negotiations anyway and then um we came to character we were talking about some of the characters and they now again this is before me too this is before um black lives matter but my main love interest in the finishing school series is black and they wanted to whitewash that character and i was like no <laughs> i was like okay uh no and they were like well you know we won't 
I was like, no, no, now you've said that, like, you got to put it in that, yeah, like, it needs to be written down that you're not going to whitewash my characters. Also, don't queerwash my characters, <laughs> like, or straightwash them. I was like, I have a lot of queer characters, you can't do that either. Um, and they were like, no, author, you cannot tell us what to do for a million dollars. And I was like, okay, then I don't need a million dollars. Um, <laughs> so, sure. yeah, I totally walked, I completely walked away from the deal, because I was like, yeah. I don't, I don't, you know, it wasn't, I am not one of those authors who like dreams of having my stuff adapted. Uh, it's never been something that particularly interests me. I'm not a big film buff or anything like that, but also like, I don't need a million dollars. That's fine. Yeah. And I wonder, cause I, I'm conscious of time and not keeping everyone too long, but there was a certain publishing experience we kind of talked about before, before at the start, before we got going. And I wondered if you had kind of the time and headspace to go into that a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I did. I did allude to this a little bit, but essentially because of the option clause situation where the um, the first publisher that had found me out of slush who like loved my book, the editor was just ecstatic, was so excited. They were not offering me and they were offering me like three, three or four grand, but they were a prestige house that I was very familiar with because I read many of their authors were quite beloved. She called me, I was at a coffee shop writing or working on correcting papers or something. And uh, like, I saw the 212 New York number on my phone and I was like, what? And it was like, hi, this is so-and-so. I'm the editor at blah, blah, blah. And I love your book and I really want to publish it. And I think I spat latte foam and like then ran out the back of the cafe and quietly had hysterics for a while. Um, so it was very exciting. Um, like it is the dream, right? Like that's the actual dream. And then, um, this is where I always say, never say yes. Always say, let me contact my agent, even if you don't have one. Uh, cause I said yes. And that caused a lot of problems. Um, although, you know, this isn't the UK, um, a man's word is not his bond, <laughs> but, um, yeah, and so then I then I reached out to a couple of agents. I asked the publisher if they had an agent they really liked, and they recommended one that they had worked with for various authors. So I approached him, and then I approached Kristen, who had rejected me for a previous YA series, but she'd done it so nicely and with so much thought that I was like, hmm, I really like her. I also really liked uh, her kind of business model like she wasn't New York based and I knew that she'd broken from a um she, to start up her own she was relatively new she was relatively young she was relatively hungry I knew she had no kids I was later to learn that she is a workaholic you want that in an agent <laughs> it's very good um no distractions from my agent thank you very much um so I approached those two agents and one of them who shall remain nameless uh passed me along to his assistant and pretty was pretty dismissive. Um, and Kristen got back to me within like 24 hours and was like, yeah, it looks great. I love it. You have an offer on the table. Let's do this. Um, so that was the agent sorted. And then, um, then we had this like crazy contract negotiation over the option clause, which just went on forever with this particular editor that had praised me and continued to do so to my face on the phone. Um, just like becoming more and more of a harridan to my my now newly hired and beloved agent um, over specifically the option clause. And eventually uh, I was the one, well, mutually my agent and I were just like, this is totally ridiculous. And I'm like, I mean, this is like end of term, like this has been drawn out over the holidays and into spring. And I like, I'm correcting term papers and I'm working on my thesis and I'm just like, Try someone else. <laughs> like, this is too ridiculous for this little game of a hobby with this playful, silly book I wrote. Like, yeah, do something else. Like, yeah. you know, again, I was just like, Agent, what do you think? But try something else. And we tried different publisher. And, and it's interesting because, um, oh, I mean, obviously we won't name them on air, but like, I, I do know this publisher and specifically the editor. And very recently, within like the last two years, I've had an author friend who kind of went on submission to them and um when things started not working out between them that behavior was exactly the same the a the editor was screaming at my friend's agent at my friend's agency yeah. there was a lot of vitriol and and just like unprofessional behavior and it did end with the author canceling that contract and walking away because because they yeah. just couldn't be bothered to deal with it anymore and they found the book a different home so it it's 
sad but not surprising I guess to hear that that behavior is the same even across the gap of years from the same place and same people um which is not tour just, <laughs> just throwing that out there <laughs> no you're fine um yeah sorry you I, I feel like we've been a bit all over the place so I might I might move bits of the conversation around later but I was gonna say um uh, unless you've got further questions, Scott, I was going to ask if you felt like plugging yourself, Gail, and just telling people where they could find you. And definitely, um... <laughs> yeah, there were. I mean, there were a couple of things. Like, I, I, I did want to mention oh, in yeah, case sure. this comes up, and you need to point people this direction. That I have also been in the position of having to buy myself out of a contract. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. um, I, I, just, I know you mentioned at one point that you'd never. Oh my God! Please stop. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I'm so I do sorry, want to hear guys. about that if you yeah, yeah, yeah got um, to tell that. So I was actually approached by a, an editor to write a YA series. Um, and they preempted the offer with a six-figure deal for a four-book series. Um, but I also pitched the follow-up spin-off series for my first uh, five-book series to Orbit. So now the preempt had gone to Little Brown, which is also a Hachette house. So essentially I had two book deals on the table, one for this four book YA series, which I had already started writing. I was already like a couple of books in on that one. And then this new spinoff for the, of the Solace series called the Custer Protocol series. And I thought I could write one book and then another book and one book and then another book, one book. And it turns out I cannot do that. <laughs> like, I can't do that with series, especially series that are kind of in the same universe. The main character's voices just started getting really muddled in my head. Um, and it was it was just, I was like, this is not going to work. I tried to do the first book in the new adult series and it didn't work. And I had to turn around to Orbit um, and just be like, I don't know how you want to handle this but you have two options. I can buy back my advance. The advance was for a two book deal. That's always what Orbit does. I was like, I can buy back on a two book deal. Um, or uh, you can hold for two years while I have time to finish finish this four book series. Um, and there was a, you know, a good couple of months there where my agent was like, I've never had to do a renegotiation. Like, you know, and I was like, I can pay back the advance. Like I just, you know, stuck in a savings account. I don't like, I don't know how this works either, but like, I'm prepared to do this. Um, and, and we really did think we were going to have to do it. We were really going into those negotiations. And, and then eventually Orbit was just like, we'll wait, we'll, we'll just hold it and wait. So it did work out okay, but I did start that negotiation. So I do know that it's possible, but yes, you do have, to, that's the one instance where you would have to pay back your advance. Yeah. So, and I'm the only one I know who's ever like been put in that situation before. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah, it makes sense. I, I think you know, were you to cancel a contract, that's what they have, what they stand to lose. Yep. Yeah, and then that that last series was a nightmare series. That was a series where everything that they'd done right with my first series they did wrong with that last series. They released it in hardcover. They charged too much for the ebook. They didn't roll out quickly enough. They didn't do arcs. They, you know, it was just, yeah, it was Sounds pretty familiar. much, yeah. I got orphaned uh, badly uh, twice. You know, I ended Sounds up with familiar. an editor who did not, was not interested in my books, didn't like them. <laughs> yeah, I was like, wait, I know this story. <laughs> yeah. And can you see that difference in your sales? Oh yeah. Yeah. It was remarkable. Yeah. Okay. And it's, and it's, and I will often say like, I'm sorry to break your bubble authors out there, but like, even when you make it and you do good and you give them everything you, that they want and you're a front list, they are, they will still hand you out to dry. <laughs> you know? In fact, yeah. sometimes they're almost more likely to, because they expect you perf to perform without their help. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, to mm -hmm. cap that story, I went on recently to write a series, um, which is non-commercial. It's not a genre that sells very well, which frankly was what Solus was way back in the day. Um, and it went back out on sub. So I was out on sub recently as a front lister, as like 13 New York Times, right? 
And uh, 57 rejections later uh, just goes to show that like everyone gets rejected. Everyone will get dropped. Like, yeah, it, it can happen. It can happen. I don't mean to be a downer, but no, no, <laughs> all the good can happen and all the bad can happen. Yeah, it, it is very, very fickle. Yep. Yeah, yep, that was fantastic. I, I think so. Uh, yeah, now I really will, if that's okay, ask you if you want to plug yourself. Where can people find you and your books and your blogs and things? Sure. And I'll get a list of links um, off you at the end. <laughs> so this is the point where I say um, I really am on social media to interact with my readers um, because yes. they're multitudes and they take a lot of time and attention. I do adore them. Um, so if you follow me on the social medias, you will hear about my fiction. Um, if you are interested in nonfiction, and I do have a like a kind of a massive nonfiction project coming up, um, but and in the craft of stuff that is almost exclusively on my blog. So go to Gail Carriger, and I have a resources tab on my blog, and under that tab are two sections. One is for new authors, and one is for established authors, and it is going to be both stuff I've written, just all sorts of things from like how cover art works to other things like that, but also links to good podcasts and stuff that other people have written. So I like to help as much as I can. That's the way I've figured out how to help newbies in particular. Um, during NaNoWriMo month of November, I do take over all of my social medias with write stuff where I will talk about being a writer and stuff like that. Um, yeah, so go to my blog is probably the best resource that I have. The nonfiction project I have coming up is called Going Hybrid. And it is how to move from traditional publishing to self-publishing without going crazy. Um, and it will have checklists cool. and worksheets and all the things. <laughs> so <laughs> um, if you are one of those authors who is thinking about that as a possible career pivot, um, the book is coming, I promise. <laughs> it's, it's really coming. Because um, I've been pretty successful doing that. I make uh, as oh, much wow. now as I did when I was a New York Times bestseller. And... Uh, no way. And 80% of my income is self-published. So I made, yeah. And I did that in five years. That's how long it took me to, to make that transition. Well, it took three years to do the complete pivot, um, but I gave myself five years to make that transition. So it is possible. You can do it. It can be done. Um, yeah. So yeah, no, find me on the website. So <laughs> yeah. And if you, if you do want access to any of the back end, like okay. data kind of stuff, um, just again, my website has a Perfect. has a little contact page. You can just drop me a calling card. It'll no, be that's great. Thank. You. <laughs> maybe a little while. I'll be in Thailand for a month, so that's I'm gonna okay. be a little slow to respond. But I promise I'll get back at you. That's okay. I'm I'm always slow to respond these days. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. And especially thank you to both of you because my I'm just so spaced out. I had like a two hour Zoom call earlier, and now I'm just like. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's been really good. Um, and thank you again so much. And yeah, uh, I'm really distracted by your nails, Scott. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I hope you have a good... Oh, do that one more time. Do that one more time. <laughs> well, Gail, it was wonderful chatting Perfect. with you. I learned you. Uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thanks for... Um, yeah. yeah, thanks for allowing me to press you into having me on um yeah and and i'm i'm glad to to talk about anything I'm glad to help anytime um sometime in person i'll get more stories out of you but yeah oh, well, in the meantime is the, yeah. <laughs> that is the rule is i do do quite a number of conventions and if you <laughs> buy me a drink at a convention i will tell you anything you want to know and then okay. deny it online later <laughs> so okay. it's a real secret <laughs> World con it is, right. <laughs> You've been listening to the Publishing Radio Podcast with Sunny Dean and Scott Drakeford. Tune in next time for more in-depth discussion on everything publishing industry. See you later.